All right. Well, hello. Um, hello, people I can see and hello, people I can't see on, on, on the Zoom call. This is the beginning of the third week of the A summer school and it's going to be a really, really hot week. Uh, so I really hope that you all have a fun um, really close or an AC or some some cool shade. Um, and I just want to welcome Davis, who is going to introduce uh, two wonderful um, architects going to share their uh, the work all the way from New York, Ale Alessandro Orsini and, and Nick Roseborough. Uh, thank you so much for joining the, the, the summer school uh, public uh, program. Uh, we're running um, a lecture series and kind of in, in the middle of, of the, the AA day. Um, it's, it's the beginning of the day for, for some, some online units or the end of the day uh, for, for them. Um, many different voices have, have joined the conversation. Eventually, we're all going to be able to kind of look at the archive together. Uh, but it's, it's a really important act of togetherness to bring everybody online and on site, um, sharing uh, some, some common grounds uh, that, that will help uh, feed into the, the, the unit's uh, agenda and conversation. Um, so it would be great also for Davis to, to um, explain a little bit more like what the connection is with uh, his unit and, and, and how your work, your, um, your practice is, is relevant to, to what they are uh, they're looking into. Um, yeah. Welcome. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Sophia. Um, yeah, so my name is Davis Richardson. Um, I'm uh, Along with Chris Gardner, uh, we are uh, leading uh, Unit 9, uh, the online unit. Uh, Chris and I are both based in New York City uh, as practitioners. Um, and, and our unit here at the AA this summer is called Of What We Will, um, Architecture of Public Leisure. Um, and so we are looking at, in our unit, we're looking at the, uh, the labor movement and leisure and um, aesthetics of, of public space and public leisure, public being, um, uh, focus specifically around water. So we're looking at things like public pools, um, spas, bathhouses, things of that nature. Um, so it's been it's been a great two weeks so far, and we're excited to to wrap up this week uh, with with our with our students kind of working on uh, proposing projects within that realm. Um, a lot of that has taken inspiration, frankly, from Nick and Alessandro's work, um, who are friends and colleagues of ours here in New York City as well. Um, they have their own practice architecture, which I'll introduce here shortly, but we're really excited to have them uh, on board um, there. Uh, you know, well, I'll give you the full bio on some of the awards that they've won, but they're a fantastic practice, two really wonderful people. Um, and their work is frankly, um, you know, has a lot of a lot of allegiances with what what we're interested in and, and really leads the way of what we're what we're researching. They're, I think, further along, quite further along than than uh, than even we are in this research and so uh we have a lot to learn from them and uh are excited to hear about some of the things that they've been working on in this realm uh, architensions is an architectural design studio operating as an agency of research led by alessandro orsini and nick roseborough and based in new york and rome the studio was founded in 2010 as a vehicle to investigate the city in a spatial form and was refounded in 2013 with nick roseborough Diverse in backgrounds and creative experience, the studio looks at architecture, design, and the city with a perspective rooted in site specificity, enabling them to explore new ways to, to connect history and culture. Architensions works at the intersection of theory, practice, and academia, focusing on architecture as a network condition and continuous dialogue with the political and social context, and aiming to create new possibilities for the contemporary city. Their search for an aesthetic is an ever-changing process grounded in drawings, collages, sketches, and models. They like discrete geometries and grids, but they constantly seek new interpretations of their spatial outcomes. Researching and teaching for them is a mode of practice, not just in the academic space, but also in the studio. They believe in a pedagogical approach to practice. They design and they learn at the same time. They expand their practice through writing to criti critically connect the ontology of their work with the discourse and curating to index the diverse architectural trajectories of our time. They see design as a way to define fields of action for the built environment that reconnect urbanism and architecture through processes that promote inclusivity and challenge the paradigm of architecture as a financial tool. 
Their work and research have been published in international magazines such as Domus, Frame, Wallpaper, Architectural Digest, and it exhibited at the Casa dell'Architettura Arch in Rome, at the Van Allen Institute, the Storefront for Art and Architecture, the Center for Architecture, and the Java Project Gallery in New York. In 2015, Labria published the volume Forma Urbana, focusing on studio research through a selection of projects and writings. Architections was commissioned a large public installation for the 2022 Coachella Music and Art Festival. And in addition, the studio was profiled as the next progressives in Architect Magazine in September 2020. And in 2021, Culture Magazine selected Architectures as part of their inaugural Young Architects list. Um, I'm happy to call Nick and Alessandro both friends and inspirations. Um, their work and research is, as I said, is, is just already steps ahead of the subject that's at hand uh, and the unit that Chris and I are co-leading at the AA this summer um, of what we will, which deals with architectures of public leisure. Leisure, publics, and how architecture could work as an anti-capitalist force are central to the work of architectures, which occupies the unexpected intersection of both critical and optimistic, rigorous yet playful. We take our lead from them and are honored to have them share uh, what they've been up to lately with us today. Please welcome our contingents. Um, thank you, David, for uh, the wonderful introduction. Thank you for uh, the invitation uh, to you, to Sophia, to all the team. Um, and I guess uh, we can dive immediately into the main topic. Um, uh, you know, the, despite the, the seriousness of the, of the title, we will try to make it fun as well. Um, but yeah, so architecture and leisure, um, um, the realm of freedom at the intersection of technological capitalism, it's a topic that has been uh, our focus um, since September 2017 will give a little bit of the background on how uh, this happened. Um, in, uh, in the summer 2017, the, start of the storefront for art and architecture invited us to participate in an exhibition called New New York Icons. Um, we were called to question the idea of a souvenir uh, and uh, our, our research basically revolved around the writing of a situationist Guy Debord that explored the concept of spectacle as an essential critique of capitalism. Uh, the increased tendency of social mediation through object makes our society fulfill authentic desire with commodity instead of direct life experiences, Guy Debord notes. Um, so we started to think, oh, what if a souvenir is instead a collection of situations or experiences that we leave uh, directly? So for the exhibition, we produce um, a drawing, which was part a collage, a part uh, a drawing and an etching, and a model that you can see here in the installation made by Moss Architects in the space of the storefront. Uh, we titled our project A Gilded Tale, and it was just the beginning of uh, diving into this question of um, what is leisure from the idea of being a tourist in the city and acquiring um, uh, a souvenir. Um, immediately, um, we dive into uh, the main problematic surrounding leisure. Um, when is inserted in a capitalist economy. So the logic of industrialization were responsible for the separation between labor and free time, uh, and so in turn, leisure. The notion of free time became connected to work or the absence of it. And the institution of what um, Thorsten Veblen identifies as the leisure class, a privileged group of people exempt from work. Um, so in the book, The Theory of the Leisure Class, uh, Thorsten Beblen um, also uh, starts to theorize uh, what he calls the conspicuous consumption. So it's all that consumption of the, uh, of the leisure class that is basically superfluous, um, unnecessary. And it, it is also attached to an aesthetic, an ostentatious one, which lead into the institution of the first museum. 
you can see here in the slides uh, one of the so-called room of curiosity. This is in Naples, Ferrante Imperato, 1559. Um, and then uh, this is a painting that is in the Royal Collection um, of the Tribuna of the Uffizi in Florence. Um, the, the first called the Wonder Kammer of Cabinet of Curiosity, these spaces were filled with collectible objects that soon became a representation of power. Furthermore, the separation of free time versus labor is further propelled by technology. Technology, um, technology uh, assumes a very important role uh, in the uh, question of leisure and free time. Uh, in particular, the clock. In 1888, uh, Villar Bundy uh, uh, completely altered the way business handle, uh, was handled the time uh, tracking. Bundy, uh, along with several other inventors during that time period, developed a variety of mechanical time recording devices to help business keep track of their employees' hours. Um, so from here is the institution of the so-called clocked in economic regime that has been uh, the main economic regime uh, until more recently where other economic regime uh, took place. Uh, a, number, um, a number of prototype for life after work uh, were developed uh, at the end of the, uh, of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, and the, and the turn of the century as well. Um, all this project uh, envision an alternative paradigm uh, to the one that we know in which uh, individual must work in order to uh, live. Um, the creation of spaces and programs for free time, such as the theater, stadium, and the park, prefigured the institution of the leisure and, cons and consumer culture, a condition of capitalism that in 1959 became the site of constant Neuenhaus um, experimentation. So you can see here in the slides um, two of the early drawings of a new Babylon. Uh, so during the post-war years, Constant uh, had imagined and designed a city of improvisation, chances and play, as a critical alternative to the burdens imposed by production. This city, New Babylon, where um, Huizinga's homo ludens become a moral and an ethical subject, represent a paradigmatic critique of the modern industrial city. Play, as Huizinga observed, is older than culture, and all human activities can be related to play where the great instinctive forces of civilized life have their origin, law and order, commerce and profit, craft and art, poetry, wisdom and science. Another very important project that envisioned a life uh, beyond work um, is uh, the Fun Palace that you can see here in the perspective from um, their authors. Um, it was commissioned by uh, Dran Littlewood uh, and uh, basically uh, elaborated together with architect Cedric Price, uh, which they came up with the idea of a fan palace um, as one building in 1961. It was their dream to build a space where people in the community could come together to celebrate uh, life, art, science, and culture. The Fawn Palace project was an interactive and adaptable educational and cultural complex to be located in London, England. The project was to be erected on a disused um, public land slated for redevelopment and intended to be dismantled after 10 years. Conceptual and design development drawing were created for a typical fun palace that could be erected um, on any suitable site and or several sites were con uh, although were considered, some belonging to a civic trust. That same year, the question of collective experiences in a productive society was focus, um, was the focus of a speculative project by 
Atrasatsas Jr. call the planet as a festival. Located in a utopian land, Sotsas imagined a world in which cities were substituted by a network of distribution centers, logistically configured in a similar manner to today's Amazon distribution center, capable of transporting consumer, consumer goods anywhere on, on Earth. Aligning his thinking closely with Constant's previous work, Sotsas foresaw a scenario wherein humans did not need to work anymore. Machines were replacing humans, improving efficiency and eliminating the conflicts that in inevitably arise when labor comes into contact with technology. In Satsa's project, the super communication allowed by technology is an opportunity to allow leisure and for work to happen by choice. Given that architecture as a model for society is no longer relevant, Satsas proposed temporary ephemeral structure as if they were designed or suggested anonymously, such as building for festival, temporary tents for seasonal gatherings, and temple for meditation to maintain the memory of happiness. So all these drawings that you see uh, through the slides, they were imagined as proposed by uh, citizens and people that had time uh, for, for leisure beyond, uh, beyond uh, the production of labor. Now we move towards corporate leisure and pastoral aesthetics. Um, in the post-war period in the US, rapid decentralization of cities led to white flight and corporations' interest in suburban pastoral landscapes. These corporations sought to extend their control and management with new typologies in what Luis Mozingo differentiates, differentiates into three types, the corporate campus, the corporate estate, and the office park. The pastoral landscapes influence uh, its society with its beauty, but the domestic and corporate architecture produced on this landscape made a lasting impression on the workers of the corporation and their production. Here we have an example of Kevin Roche and John Dinklu um, Union Carbide headquarters in Connecticut in 1976, um, which is a perfect example of um, corporate, corporate leisure and corporate architecture in the pastoral landscape. The interior offices are immersed in abundance of natural and forest, uh, nature and forest. This is a condition that created a stark difference with the suburban domesticity of its employees. Materials were rich, spaces were open, and there were different dining halls and many other different types of programs such as uh, gymnasiums, medical facilities, cafeterias, etc. Not far from the previous one, the Richard Vix headquarters were built with the same ethos. The interiors were in direct visual contact with the surrounding forest. This type of aesthetic became a gift to the worker where the architecture and its related aesthetics conditioned the workers for greater production. The architecture's embedded elements of leisure, amenities, perks, and, and benefits kept the workers of the corporations faithful and devoted to the corporation's production. Less concerned with their employees' well-being than the other, um, than their own productivity, companies supported studies for the creation of stress release programs in their headquarters. For instance, in 1973, McDonald's commissioned associate space design to create Think Tank at their Chicago headquarters. Think Tank was conceived as a space for free time where workers could escape their normal patterns of work to relax, write, think, and recharge. Although marketed as an amenity for the employees, we can speculate that the initiative was based on creative labor extraction, all for the profit of the company. Disguised as a corporate benevolence, towards its workers, the project became a model for a strategy focused on maximum productivity, adopted 
or revise decades later by tech companies such as Apple, Google, and Facebook. We're gonna move forward to a leisure and public space. And by the second decade of the 12th century, modern planning had already been, um, 20th century, correct. Um, modern planning, planning had already, already began to account for alternate, alternating patterns of living and working, generating the need to create leisure spaces for employees. The creation of parks became a symbol of health in the modern city, as Old Olmsted highlights. Under the provision of the 1935 Resettlement Administration in the United States and the 1936 Housing Act in Great Britain, community centers became central in the planning of new urban developments and expansions, together with the provision of playgrounds in public housing projects and city parks. And you can see here, we have Aldo, Aldo Van Eyck's The Playgrounds in Amsterdam, 1947 to 1978. Um, so the combination of technology and leisure have been changing the form of mass gathering. For instance, music festival, art venues, thematic exhibition and sport events, adding layers of complexity to experience life collectively. Uh, some took place historically away from urban centers and were ideologically and politically oriented. The inevitable reference as a prototypical gathering is the Woodstock Music and Art Festival or Aquarian Exposition held in August 1969 in Bethel, New York, with 400,000 people in attendance, in attendance over the span of three days. The festival is considered a pivotal moment in the definition of the counterculture generation, a collective experience of people of different races and backgrounds gathering to promote peace and manifest their opposition to the Vietnam War and the rising of social injustice in the United States. In 1970, the, the first Glastonsbury Festival was organized around a spiritual manifesto celebrating the environment and later in conjunction with the protest movement for the non-proliferation nuclear, nuclear treaty of the late 70s. The organizer described the festival as the expression of free thinking people in connection with nature and the earth. Um, tickets were affordable, um, about one pound, and included a complimentary bottle of milk. In 1971, Bill Harking designed and built scaffolding in the form of a pyramid with expanded metal and plastic sheeting, marking one of the first occurrences of an art installation made for a music festival. After a few years, the gathering lost its political stand to focus primarily on the collective social experience that will create a sense of community within the campsite, with music being one element of the sharing juncture. A uh, couple of years before, uh, in 1968, um, the Ruta de la Amistad, an installation made of 19 large scale sculpture was built for the Olympic games in Mexico City. Um, moved by the same ethos of international friendship and harmony, uh, initiated a trend of using art and architecture as a way to manifest an ideological significance of an event. Sometimes also uh, taking the risk of um, ethical conflicts and cultural appropriation um, when this um, same um, sort of um, art uh, manifestation was uh, used for propaganda. Now we're moving towards the Coachella Valley Music and Art Festival and the project that we proposed and was built called The Playground. The festival itself, the inaugural, the inaugural uh, Coachella Festival was held um, during the, um, the 9th and 10th of October in 1999 in Indio, California, which is located in the Coachella Valley near Palm Springs. From the outset, Paul Tolette, the founder, enlisted several high, high profile music artists to partic in, participate in the event, such as Beck, Rage Against the Machine, and the Chemical Brothers. The, the area defined by suburban low density developments, 
The Coachella Valley embodies the idea of the suburban sprawl supported by private transportation in, in the United States, whereby unrestricted growth happens without concern towards land occupation and environmental resources exploitation. But more problematic aspects emerge when we um, um, pursue, um, peruse the uh, local geography of the festival. The, the valley is located in an area that is emblematic of the definition of leisure in America, with its golf courses, polo fields, and resorts, infrastructures that the music festival takes advantage to welcome large a large number of people. The region's landscapes in warm weather propelled it to become a significant tourist attraction, a place that offered um, re recreation as a way of life, as it was popularized in, in books and, and magazines such as The Land of Sunshine and Out West, as well as by Hollywood in, entertainment in, industry, uh, establishing the West as the, as the mediated land of entertainment for many generations. The concept for the playground, our project playground, evolved from a field condition. We imagined a city dedicated to play and fun. It was not yet site specific. It was in fact a large drawing that could somehow crystallize our research. And as you can see here, we have six plates of a conceptual idea of this space and these ideas. Here you can see a roof plan that shows a configuration of objects hugging a central system of plazas or piazzas as we call them. For us, it was about how to generate public space in the context of the festival where the only spatial alternative are the music stages and a few, few food nodes. Our design proposes a fragment of a city, a node for engaging festival goers in collective interactions and in performance, relaxation and play. The project is a series of grid-like tall modular towers holding shapes of various forms, evoking a familiar urban landscape and original definition of leisure. Similar to Sector Prices from Palace, the grid aspired to be an opportunity to create a new common ground, an open spatial condition that opposes the isolation and homogeneity of technologically mediated experiences. Uh, we originally imagined uh, a series of towers, six in total, as we started to study how a basic module will become an opportunity to shape them. Here in this drawing, you see like really the evolution of the six towers. Uh, we thought uh, about like dividing them into uh, different floors. This is the uh, really uh, an early conceptualized drawing. Um, also, uh, this idea of the piazzas developed at the base of this like urban fragment became uh, really uh, the focus of, uh, of this project. Uh, the design of the piazza evolved uh, from a more solid to a more porous and accessible, uh, a node for engaging festival goers in collective interaction and in a performance, relaxation and play. Uh, really the idea of the project revolved around a sort of a, uh, counteracting um, the uh, the other activities that are available um, in the in the in the campsite of uh, of Coachella. Um, this is the final shape of the piazza um, as it was built, um, revolving around the towers and uh, creating these like semi-circular shapes, which would um, create more of a, an intimate uh, sort of urban setting in the completely, you know, uh, suburban landscape of the uh, of Coachella. Uh, this is a drawings that show how the towers relate to the public space. Um, and the drawings also that shows their position. 
Uh, and this is uh, a taxonomy of component um, which focus uh, on quantity of material for the piazzas and the benches. Um, we are we are now basically showing uh, the, the process of the design and how from uh, conceptual uh, thinking we went into sort of the construction and um, sort of like the idea that stood behind uh, the piece. Some questions um, people have uh, uh, about the project is how we derive the colors. And in the beginning, we, we knew that we wanted to have uh, many different types of colors and our early concepts um, were very incongruent and we needed a system to understand how the colors um, would appear on the towers. So we, given that we were very fascinated with uh, dichroic film, um, we decided to use um, cyan, magenta, and yellow, which we derived from the dichroic film. We did some studies understanding that the transmittance and the reflection of the material um, output different colors. And as you can see here, I have the magenta with cyan and yellow. And then we then started to mix and create a adjacent mixing colors to come up with um, a, a robust scheme. As you can see here, we have the dichroic film, we have the blaze and the chill, and the transmission light going through the material allowed us to have a color range from cyan all the way to magenta, even a little bit of an orange. So you get the spectrum between those two colors, including purple, uh, et cetera. And the same goes for the chill, which um, you would go from magenta to yellow. The reflectance on those same materials give a, 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 a dynamic and new uh, idea of what the material can do in terms of its color. So you get greens and yellows on, on this first one. And as you can follow uh, my pointer on this one, you get a similar effect in continuing the spectrum of, of light and color. This is an example of the color scheme for our, the first tower and largest tower of our scheme. Um, and as you can see here, we applied the yellow to the frame, and then we applied it an adjacent color of, uh, of an orange. And then we also to applied the shapes. to the shapes, exactly. And then we applied dichroic film and a mirror film, which I'll let Alessandro speak about momentarily. And here is our final um, color scheme that we submitted. Um, for this, this scheme, including the materials of the um, mirror film and the two types of dichroic film and shapes and frameworks and piazza. Here's a rhino model of the towers being used to produce the shop drawings. Um, we developed a uh, centerline grid um, for each tower uh, as well as a eight different types of grid for the site itself for orientation. Here you can see uh, another rhino model of the bridge connections, which you'll see later, the bridges. Um, and we basically, each tower has a, a module of seven by seven by seven feet. And uh, each section is two of those modules in height. And so here you can see that we have a diagram of the bridge connecting vertically on tower one and on this side uh, um, sitting on top of tower five, section three. This process entails, the, um, in, in this part we have the, the we show a little bit um, closer what's happening with the mirror film, the styrene used for the opaque shapes um, in the application of these materials on the framework. Here are process photos showing uh, the modules being loaded uh, uh, and paint, um, being painted and moved from different locations. Um, also showing how we were able to achieve the, the um, geometry. And so we used wood, which was more flexible um, instead of steel. And this was more cost effective as well. And here we can see the transportation of modules using trucks. Um, and here you can see a better picture of the, um, that we saw earlier this year of the, um, the pieces being 
taken directly to the site. Yeah, I think that you can, you can see from the people and from, uh, these are special transportation trucks. And so you can see uh, from scale that, you know, a couple of modules of the towers were um, extremely tall. Um, and so very challenging to, um, to transport on site, although the site was not uh, very far. And the idea between this, um, the double stack, you have the seven by seven by seven module um, twice as one section was to complete the tower as much as possible with these sections to be transportable on these larger trucks, uh, allowing for an easier installation on site. And so uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a photo that was um, taken uh, basically uh, the day before unveiling uh, the installation. This is the installation um, completed. Um, it's, uh, it's not immediately easy to understand the scale, but uh, for us, uh, it was really about a fragment of the city. Why it was about the fragment of the city? Because we wanted to create an opportunity for, um, uh, for creating public space, really an alternative to the, uh, to the, to the stage um, and the music. And um, several, um, several questions arised uh, while we were designing this. And uh, one uh, immediate reference was Aldo Rossi, Il Teatro del Mondo, because um, it became uh, really the paradigm of this architecture where the visitor become really part of uh, the performance and becomes a performer as it was happening. Uh, in Aldo Rossi, Il Teatro del Mondo. So for us, we wanted to uh, create an architecture that was not um, simply um, static, but um, we wanted to create a, a sort of a, a personal interaction. And so um, we, we started to uh, analyze materiality and the possibility yeah. to allow uh, a mirror film to come to the base of the tower, of, of the towers in, in a way that uh, you can mirror yourself, you can dance in front of it, um, and so on. And uh, another, uh, another um, material study went into the dichroic film because of the series of um, reflection on the ground that changes with the, change, with the, with the rotation of the sun. Of the sun. So um, the, everything became like, th there was, a, there was a, a phenomenological component in the whole design that we took into account. And so this is uh, another photo from the same day. Um, you can see that uh, the, it's uh, the, the star conference also with the sky and, 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 and uh, the mountain that you can see far away. Um, a photo that is really uh, emblematic because there are no pictures, uh, people interacting with it um, the day before. I would just like to note the just the, the demonstration of the of this tower in the foreground here, which has a magenta framework, and then it has this adjacent mixture of mixing magenta and cyan of a, a type of purple, and then in the middle you see another version of that purple. And so the the idea of it between the solid shapes were to ha not have exactly the same color, but have an adjacent color, and you can see the orange. Um, the light orange behind this purple tower and this other darker orange. Um, this is a photo that um, allows uh, to understand the, the volume composition and how the, the grid becomes an opportunity just to, uh, to hold the shapes. Shapes that comes from the, that very early um, uh, conceptual drawing in which we made a collection of arcades, the amphitheaters, all geometries that relates to the history of leisure. And a photo from below, which is also allows you to, to see how like the mirror, the mirror interacts with just with your eyes, but also at the very top, um, the iridescence of the of, of, of the dichroic film. And finally, um, some photos with 
people. Um, it was um, very interesting for us to see that um, some of the hopes that were behind our design um, were sort of materializing. Um, so one important thing that we want to say is that uh, while we knew that the project uh, setting was really the epitome of uh, late capitalism, uh, we still wanted to create something that in a way um, could symbolize and an, a sort of an anti-capitalist um, symbolic thing um, in the context of Coachella. Uh, how we thought we could have achieved that, simply uh, deterring um, people from, uh, for example, using their phones or using um, simply the, the towers as a background. And um, uh, little by little, while we were experiencing um, the installation, uh, little by little, we saw that that hope materialized because creating a public space and cre creating a gathering um, really created an opportunity for more socialization, talking, um, and another very interesting element um, of the architecture was the scale. The scale was not just uh, the power of, uh, of this um, like complex geometry, but it was really um, a, an opportunity for um, sort of uh, asking other people, for example, to, to take a picture of you within the space. All of a sudden it, become, it became a space. We heard a lot of people saying, can you take a picture of me within the space? Because uh, the, the self-actualization of the, of the photograph didn't work anymore. So in a sense, all those hopes of uh, making people interact with each other and not necessarily um, basically using the installation as a background um, sort of happened little by little during the day. Um, the installation also um, changed uh, radically um, through, through, the, through the time of the day. In the morning, uh, the colors were uh, very much sort of very strong and, and sort of colder while a sunset uh, this was happening, like the, all the oranges and all the yellows came out from, uh, from, the, fa from the frames, from the shapes, uh, creating this sort of a, uh, what Moth Magazine called surreal color, but there was no intention of neither calling them that way. It's just that happened because the, the careful study of the, of the color spectrum really uh, responded to also this phenomenology of the sun interacting with the structure itself. And here's a final image showing uh, a few of the towers, actually all four of them, if you look closely, um, in the middle of the day, which shows a brilliance in the color. Again, adding to what Alessandro said, in another version of the surreal, um, uh, what they called surreal. Um, but I think this is a very interesting uh, in, um, photo because you, you get to see the iridescence of the dichroic film in tandem with the solid shapes and its brilliance. So um, one thing that we want to say sort of in conclusion is that as in Constance New Babylon, our playground complicate, uh, complicated architecture as an experimental space yet to be fully completed or built in its complex imagery, giving people agency to self-determine their physical interaction. Uh, we hope that uh, th this, this could symbolize a hope that in the future leisure will occur in a place where free time does not indicate um, a sort of a wealth or the status of a person. And so our project really aim at deterring uh, consuming the environment through the digital media or through the phone only, further promoting the realization, um, for, for the, the, the idea that um, we can move uh, away from uh, a sort of uh, uh, the, the, the work that the festival goers produce, because all that uh, all that mm, sort of like stories on social medias and photographs are basically 
uh, free labors that is made by festival goers. So we were really happy to witness how the scale played a role um, of like interacting socially in the piazzas um, and, um, and, and sort of creating a dynamic different experiences of the space itself. Perhaps we can hope that um, so we were we were talking about uh, economic regime, the clocked in regime that became um, like basically the paradigm of uh, the worker, and it still is. Uh, but today we have uh, the login regime that is another alternative um, uh, economic paradigm because a lot of work is produced online. Uh, simply logging in on a platform and producing work. This is exactly what happens in uh, this uh, type of festivals where basically the login works produce um, free labor. Um, and so uh, we hope that uh, when the revolution of new modes of production fully takes place, um, as we have seen in Etrosatsas Junior, the planet as a festival, and the Homo Ludens of New Babylon uh, perhaps will inhabit our towers in the Coachella Valley. So we are concluding here, and hopefully we can generate a little bit of discussion. And before, before we do that, I just would really like to note that we do not do this by ourselves. Um, all of the research and, and the projects that we've showed uh, that are, are our contentions have been um, um, uh, helped and supported by people who have worked and still work in the office, including uh, Georgia Girardi, Ana Laura Pinto, um, Gerald Rubia, and G.A. Son. Great. Well, thank you, guys. This was, this was really fantastic. Um, I think if anybody uh, who is watching has questions, feel free to go ahead and drop them in the chat, um, or we may open it up in a minute. But I have a I have a couple of questions to at least kind of get the get a little bit of discussion, uh, you know, get a little bit of discussion uh, going on this. I mean, it, it's a you know it's a fascinating project. Like the research, obviously re leading up to it is is super interesting. Um, I, I, one of the things I thought that was really interesting about it and that I had never, I had not realized despite looking and talking with you guys about this project is that it, it basically started as this is kind of an, a certain instantiation of a, of a much larger idea or, or of this being kind of like the never ending plan, the, the six plates that you showed at the beginning. Um, may, could you talk a little bit about that? Like, is that drawing on like, you know, uh, examples of super studio, would you call that, would you call it kind of a manifesto that this is just sort of a, an example that's sliced out of? Yeah, I mean, um, we, we had um, a number of, uh, of references, of course. We were um, at that time really investigating a lot about um, this, this idea of, uh, um, corporate abstractive practices and capitalism leisure and this idea that uh, somehow uh, is still attached to leisure to leisure who can who can take time off who can really freely take time off and so one of the one of the uh, immediate reference became um, uh, the continuous monument um, but also um, Andrea Brandt's in No Stop City, those were all uh, uh, reference, uh, references. And um, so our idea was like, uh, what if uh, we create a sort of an archaeology of leisure? And so we started to really collect a number of uh, uh, typology for leisure. Um, it, and this this discussion in the office happened because um, when we were invited to um, to submit the proposal for um, for Coachella, uh, we had a, a very um, like general brief because um, the um, they, they don't come to you and say can you create something for Coachella, but it's it's really about your research. And so we, we took this opportunity to, to, further, to further go in, 
into what uh, we thought it was um, the subject of research at that time coming uh, from the analysis of, you know, what is a souvenir and, and so on. Uh, and so a lot of things related to um, uh, this sort of radical project that were happening in the 70s, but we were at the same time interrogating ourselves on um, what has changed today. And so, uh, yes, the continuous moment uh, monument was a, a reference, um, but the continuous mon uh, monument was um, very specific in time and place in which uh, uh, the economic boom um, of the late 60s also uh, propelled uh, a number of situations. And uh, we, we started to clearly uh, see immediately that uh, our economic context of, of late capitalism was a little bit different. And one, one thing that, you know, kind of relate to that drawing of the sixth plate is that the way we use typologies for, for leisure is radically different. So why we gather uh, in this like sort of suburban setting is radically different. While we have seen that Woodstock or Glastonsbury became this like sort of a, a counterculture um, situation um, and literally um, uh, the, the gathering revolved around a specific theme. Today, not necessarily this gathering uh, produced um, visibly or, or revolves around counter counterculture. Mm -hmm. But um, at the same time, we have witnessed that uh, counterculture sometimes is not immediately uh, visible. Yes, no, yeah. And we really think that this idea of uh, the gathering, and it, this was also very peculiar because um, Coachella didn't happen for two years because of COVID-19. Uh, we were in a very, uh, in a mode that propel being together. The, this idea of new togetherness is very much um, um, important uh, to, to discuss. And, and so um, counterculture didn't really, you know, doesn't really arise immediately, but um, it, it's, it's in the making. It's, 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 it's a social, it's, it becomes from the social context of the gathering. So, um, so yes, to go, to go back, um, uh, we, you know, immediately analyze certain type of utopian project or radical project. Uh, but then trying to transport them into our current condition of late stage capitalism. Great. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think it's really fascinating. And I think one of the things that is, that is very interesting in the way you talk about it, the way that you approach the project is it was um, pretty openly critical of your client. <laughs> it, it was, it was openly critical of, of the nature of Coachella and, and uh, but, but it's not, that's not to say that it, I mean, I feel like it does it 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 works well for Coachella, but it, it offers an alternative. Um, so, so the question I have is is um, you know you talk about life after work, uh, which is a certain kind of there's a certain political realities that that are that are bound up in these things. Um, I guess how do you see the role of architecture in um, in you know dealing with these issues of like life after work uh, and 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 in working in a place like Coachella, where you're kind of openly proposing an alternative to, to the to the way that things are, I guess. Um, I mean, I think that um, th there are a number of, uh, you know, questions that uh, are open and revolves around this idea of architecture and life after work. Um, I mean, one thing that we, we can say, uh, I mean, uh, your experience, Nick, is a little bit different because you, uh, you also, uh, I've never been a Coachella before. Nick um, played um, with the headliners in 2016. Yeah, 2016. Yeah. So um, it's, uh, it's a little bit, uh, um, for me, it was a, a little bit of a, uh, of a revelation because on one side, we were criticizing 
this perfect setting um, of you know late stage capitalism. Um, but at the same time, um, we uh, I, I personally had to come into the conclusion that what surface on social media it's not exactly what Coachella is. There are a lot of families with kids and uh, a lot of people that perhaps uh, really uses that as a as a moment of uh, of leisure, but as a moment, a social moment. Um, and so uh, th the question of architecture is like, can we really can can still architecture prescribe uh, what I don't know, for example, uh, uh, the space for free time, typology for free time will be in the future. Um, and uh, when we were studying the project, um, uh, the, the Ether Sots is the planet as a festival, the fact that uh, he thought oh. that architecture as a model cannot be really uh, proposed anymore. Um, I think it's, uh, it's quite interesting. Somebody has a, oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, um, yeah, so it, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's an open question on the role of architecture in life after work, uh, but especially typologically, I think that uh, Nick, uh, Nick uh, um, sort of research um, that, that you are developing on uh, the, the, the corporate the corporate leisure, the leisure as, as a gift as a to gift. the employee, employee is very much going towards that question of architecture uh, and life after, after work. Most of those um, uh, headquarters built by Kevin Roche or anyone else are mostly empty. So the, all these buildings, all these incredible machines, architecture for labor production uh, are completely um, uh, not useful anymore. There are tons of uh, square meters that are basically vacant at the moment. Well, it's also a problem of scale because these um, this topology of office building, office parks, office estates, they are so large that they're hard to maintain, especially in today's economy with inflation, etc. So some of them have been have had many attempts to start to reuse them with much failure um, because of how much it costs, you know. And so this is where how how, how can we reuse those spaces? And, and so we interrogated ourselves in, in the past few months about that. Actually, the, the, we have some collages behind us actually right here that we're, we collage over those, um, are the two examples we showed earlier um, as, a, as a critique to, uh, of the, the use of the building full of amenities, leisure um, to keep for the production instead of using the buildings for, for life after work in a sense. Yeah, because I mean, also we saw it uh, during the the the, the COVID nineteen um, sort of uh, lockdown, and we reverted to work from home. Uh, but also, again, uh, this is a topic that is coming out uh, in in an essay that Nick and I wrote together, and it's going to be published in the in the fall. Uh, this idea that uh, working from home reverted to this login uh, economic regime that is actually creating a lot of problem because it's spilling towards the realm of uh, the intimate realm of, of our own homes and our own life, like bl blending and merging, like what is labor and what is uh, life. In a sense, uh, really going back to uh, certain things at the turn of the century when, for example, uh, immigrants in New York were working um, in their own houses. And so there is this, this question that uh, is, is very much alive, like what, what certain architecture, for example, will you know, play a role, like the office building. Is it really um, a typology that uh, is not uh, uh, what we, you know, until at the beginning. Uh, so 
Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's it's difficult. Um, it's difficult to sort of uh, understand, but um, I think it's it's important to start to collect certain uh, resources, like for example, around all these buildings that are abandoned, like the corporate office park. It's part of our research, the cataloging and understanding. Uh, in a moment in which, you know, how the, the housing shortage in, in America, but a little bit everywhere um, is, is creating uh, so much harm to specific communities. So perhaps uh, life after work be, will become like a, a sort of a, re, a, a resource. Yeah, I, I, great. I, that's a fantastic answer. Um, I don't know if we're able to open it up if anybody else has any questions. I haven't I haven't seen any in the chat. Um, I could keep going, but I want to make sure that the others have a chance to to ask uh, you know ask some questions about about the project if they'd like. Yeah, if anybody has a question, they can put it in the chat or they can raise their hands to to be unmuted. Oh, there is one. Um. Yeah, Jalanta Grant wants to know where. I think you guys said that it's not. It's being published this fall, but uh, they wanted to know where they'll be able to read this essay that you just mentioned. It's being published. It will be. It will be published on Factor, and so if, if you go on our web, we will we will promote it on our website, and once it will come out um, and social media and social media. So um, Factor Journal F A K T U R. But there's nothing listed there yet. So yeah, I mean, like their new issue will come out in the fall. Um, I I have a thought uh, because we've been talking about leisure and pleasure. I think it's, it's interesting, like the more you were talking about your research and, and thinking about the fact that I arrived at all these projects before the pandemic, thinking about it now, I think all of these projects are making us think about the, the pleasure that we've lost in work as well. So in the way we work and the format of working. And I think you're kind of pushing the argument and the conversation in, in eventually those two becoming one, like we can't live in, in Constance Babylon, like we have to work. And thankfully we can access leisure. Uh, but I think you, you, you are, you're pointing at um, a future where these two are not, um, you know, kind of like mutually exclusive. Uh, there, is, there is a way that, that, that pleasure um, exists in both, um, and architecture is there to celebrate, uh, to celebrate that. Um, I mean, in a way, I'm thinking, I don't know, maybe I'm kind of projecting too much in, 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 in this, this way of reading the presentation and the argument and, and, and your work. Um, it's a little bit like the education of the architect, right? Like, it can become very tedious work it can become something to celebrate you know a process to celebrate and, and um if we can maybe borrow or steal that from from architectural education and then and, and kind of push it into into practice um might be a very um hopeful and bright way forward uh if you know what i mean <laughs> yeah yeah no totally i mean i i, I think yeah in of course, I mean, like for, for the lecture, or also we had to shrink down the, you know, the research and eliminate <laughs> certain, you know, <laughs> because yeah. it, it could have been like a little bit more uh, complex to add all the pieces. But um, uh, I, I think you're right. I mean, like um, our point of view is not necessarily the demonization of like working, but it actually is, you know, thinking how we can really celebrate um, certain aspect of our life, uh, leisure through um, architecture. And I think that also uh, work when is by choice, um, I, I think it's part of that celebration because um, um, a lot of people, I mean, we're very lucky because uh, the, the, the profession of architecture is, in a sense, 
that self actualization of what we love the most it's it's this very weird relationship in which we really uh, love what we do but it's also incredibly time consuming and incredibly labor consuming but it becomes a celebration of what you know our beliefs and and i think it's 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 very interesting what you said um it's it's a really an opportunity uh, to to celebrate and perhaps uh, I, I mean my like the question is is really how we can transform leisure into a celebration of people and not just, you know, this like divisive situation which uh, there is, you know, only few people can really take time off and when can you, you know, take time off um, or, you know, the, the c- c- certain situation that, you know, uh, could happen in which, you know, there are certain certain people that could only you know support the leisure but not really be part of the leisure so um i think i think it's uh, it you know we could be you know our project is very hopeful um of that uh, of you know reverting everything into a possibility and and i think that this idea of the new togetherness is very much towards that. I think that the sharing of the resources um, in general will allow that and will accomplish that celebration of, of leisure, the pleasure. Um, and uh, I don't know, we uh, currently have um, uh, our, uh, our research um, on um, that is, um, um, exhibited at the Center for Architecture about the new commons. And uh, I was just gonna mention that we, that actually embedded in the research is always the idea of the collective, which can be in this case in, in, is the commons. And so in this project as well, the idea is the collective. And so you, the collective can be a whole or many different nodes of it. Awesome. Yeah, and I think, I think that the, this idea of sharing, the, the idea of the new commons is very much towards like reacquiring the possibility of uh, the pleasure uh, of life and this uh, very important uh, moment of, you know, taking a time off. And in, in back, uh, back to talking about work, you know, work, you know, the word work has a connotation of, of, of non-pleasure, non-happiness. you know happiness. And so the idea of career or doing something that is t- that can be titled work that is actually could be leisure, you know, in a sense. And so I think what we're, we're hoping is that, you know, even informing architectural practice is how, how do you run a practice? How do you, how you learn, how do you teach? And what type of tools are we putting out there to allow for the workplace, for lack of a better word, to become more even and happier. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing also, uh, another thing that made me, uh, you know, when, when uh, Sophia, you made that um, uh, sort of uh, remarks about the pleasure, uh, I personally think that throughout all this research that has been going on since like the summer 2019, it seems ages ago. Uh, and uh, it, the notion of free time that is attached to the absence of work is pretty much related exclusively to the, patriar- the patriarchal structure of work. And I think that once we you know, we are able to move on from that patriarchal structure that is very much, uh, you know, something that uh, at least I see in, in younger generation that is changing because there are different type of structure in the world, different type of ideas of family and, uh, and society. And so, you know, uh, I, I think that that's when we could possibly hope for uh, a better idea of going back to uh, experiencing the pleasure of free time. Wonderful. 
I mean, one thing, one thing, the classic kind of, this is more of a comment than a question is, is, uh, is I, I do, and you kind of touched on it, is I love the optimism of it. It is, it is, uh, and it's one of the things that we've talked about in our unit is that it is simultaneously very critical of the way that things are, um, but also, you know, it, it's critical of capital and, and our current situation of the way that work uh, and leisure are separated. And it's critical of, um, in some ways of the, the nature of, of music festivals like Coachella, which are for profit enterprises and are very like kind of social media, as you mentioned, like the, the labor that they get by free social media is, is massive. Um, and it's openly critical of those things, but it's also very appropriate as a, as a, as a, an installation, which serves the space. Well, it, it is optimistic of a future, um, aesthetically, but also just projectively. Um, and that's one of the things that, that, our unit in particular has talked about, so I, I super appreciate um, this uh, this project as a model for that. Uh, it looks like we do have a, a question in the chat. Yeah. Um, some of them said they were re recently reading Neuenheis and was inspired by circus and gypsy culture and was wondering if you were also inspired by similar ways of life and materials. Wait, uh, which, uh, what is the question again? Uh, Emma Coates asked in the, said in the chat that she was recently reading Constant Neuenheis and was inspired by circus and gypsy culture and was wondering if you were also inspired by similar ways of life and materials. Do you remember? Yeah, I remember. With, well, we, we, watch, um, we watch a movie um, about that, Emma, that at the moment it doesn't, uh, it doesn't come into our mind because I, I guess <laughs> we watch too much. But in that movie, there is this huge scaffold structure. Yes. There's the circus, and, and I know that was early. It's, it's, um, it's actually a Fellini movie, Fellini, yeah. which at the end there is this like incredible, well, you know, Federico Fellini was incredibly fascinated by that specific culture of the circus. And um, the, 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 the movie ends with this like incredible, powerful image of uh, this scaffold that goes towards the sky. And, um, uh, and, and th there is this beautiful scene with the, with the circus. Um, what, um, what inspired us? Um, so yeah, two things that I want to connect. One thing that uh, Davis just said, and 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 your your question, Emma, um, about being you know positive. So we 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 never thought that this was. We we were not trying to do uh, neither a nostalgic project or um, a sort of like utopian project. When we when we linked the, the, the research to the design, uh, we did it like deliberately thinking that maybe it could have worked exactly with that ethos that the performer of a circus that you can, you can read in, in, um, in, in constant and, and, and so on. Um, uh, the, that, that simplicity of, uh, of, the, of, of the performance becomes really sort of interactive with the people that, that they are there and so on. So um, in a sense, that was our main inspiration and, and, and that's how we used uh, all the readings of New Babylon and and the reading of uh, um, also uh, Huizinga's Homo Ludens and so on. So, um, so the yes. idea of fun and play was always a key, a, a key anchor in which we departed from as we were developing the project. Also, you know, take into consideration that uh, the project, uh, the, the project had a very interesting timeline. We were uh, invited to uh, this submission in, in spring, summer 2019. Then the project was halted because of COVID-19. And we had a year and a half to like really distill certain information, but also um, we were deeply affected by COVID-19. So like the attitude of being positive was necessary in the development of the project itself. 
great. Um, Sophia, do you, do you have any other questions? Does anybody else in the chat have any other questions? Um, no, I think there are no more questions. I just, I just want to thank you for the, for, first of all, because it's really early. I don't know how much pleasure it was <laughs> <laughs> that early to join us. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the conversation. Thank you for sharing your research. I think it's, it's incredibly uh, productive for, for our students, uh, for us to, to um, have that conversation, you know, you being so generous with your references and, and of course uh, with, with the project. So again, thank you for waking really, really early uh, and for joining the, the public program of the summer school. Um, and I really hope that we can cross paths uh, in person in the future, either you coming to London or some house coming to New York. Um, there are love schools in New York that we're running from the AA. So let's let's keep the, the, the communication channel open. Definitely, definitely. Thank you again to, for the invitation to um, you and Davis. And thank you to everybody that participated today. Um, and so uh, we'll we'll keep in touch. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Great job. Bye. Bye bye.